Chapter 5, On Night Street. Granny's mind was getting more and more muddled. Lena would come home in the evenings and find her riffling through the kitchen cupboard, surrounded by cans and jars with their lids off or tearing the covers off her bed and trying to lift up the mattress with her skinny arms. It was an important thing, she would say, the thing that was lost. But if you don't know what it is, said Lena, how will you know when you found it? Granny didn't try to answer this question. She just flapped her hands at Lena and said, never mind, never mind, never mind, and kept on searching. These days, Mrs. Murdo spent a great deal of time sitting by their window rather than her own. She would tell Granny she was just coming to keep her company. I don't want her to keep me company, Grammy, Granny complained to Lena, and Lena said, maybe she's lonely, Granny, let her come. Lena rather liked having Mrs. Murdo around. It was a bit like having a mother there. She wasn't anything like Lena's own mother who had been a dreamy, absent-minded sort of person. Mrs. Murdo was mother-like in quite a different way. She made sure they all ate a good breakfast in the morning, usually potatoes with mushroom gravy and beet tea. She lined up the vitamin pills by each person's plate and made sure they were swallowed. When Mrs. Murdo was there, shoes got picked up and put away. Spills were wiped off the furniture and Poppy always had on clean clothes. Lena could relax when Mrs. Murdo was around. She knew things were being taken care of. Every week, Lena, like all workers between age 12 and age 15, had Thursday off. One Thursday, as she was standing in line at the Garn Square Market, hoping to get a bag of turnips for stew that night, she overheard a startling conversation between two people standing behind her. What I wanted, said one voice, was some paint for my front door. It hasn't been painted for years. It's gray and peeling. Horrible. I heard a store over at Night Street had some, but I was hoping for blue. Blue would be nice, said the other voice wistfully. But when I got there, the first voice continued, the man said he had no paint, never had, disagreeable man. All he had were a few colored pencils. Colored pencils? Lena had not seen colored pencils in any store for ages. Once she'd had two red ones, a blue one, and a brown one. She'd use those, these for her drawings until they were stubs too small to hold. Now, she only had one plain pencil left and it was rapidly growing shorter. She longed to have colored pencils for her pictures in the imaginary city. She had a feeling it was a colorful place. Though she didn't know what its colors might be, there were other things, of course, on which her, uh, which her money could, would be better spent. Granny's only coat was full of holes and coming apart at the seams. But Granny rarely went out, Lena told herself. She was either at home or in her yarn shop. She didn't really need a new coat, did she? Besides, how much could a few pencils cost? She could probably get a coat for Granny and some pencils. So that afternoon, she set out for Night Street. She took Poppy with her. Poppy had learned how to ride piggyback. She wrapped her legs around Lena's waist and gripped Lena's throat with her small, strong fingers. On Budlow Street, people were standing in long lines with their bundles of laundry at the washing stations. The washers stirred the clothes in the washing machines with long pulls. In days past, the machines themselves had whirled the clothes around, but not one of them worked anymore. Lena turned up Hafter Street where the Four street lamps were still out and a building crew was repairing a partly collapsed roof. Orly Gordon called out to her from high on a ladder and Lena looked up and waved. Farther on, she passed a woman with bits of rope and string for sale and a man pulling a cart full of carrots and beets to the grocery store. At the corner, a cluster of little children played catch with a rag ball. The streets were alive with people today. Moving fast, Lena threaded her way among them. 
But as she went into Otterwill Street, she saw something that had made her slow down. A man was standing on the steps of Gatherings Hall, shouting and howling, and a crowd of people had gathered around him. Lena went closer, and when she saw who it was, her insides gave a lurch. It was Sag Merrill. His arms frailed widely, and his eyes were stretched wide open. In a high, rapid voice, he wailed out a stream of words. I have been to unknown regions, he cried. There is nothing, nothing, nothing there. Did you think something out there might save us? Ha! There's only darkness and monsters and darkness and terrible deep holes. Darkness forever. The rats are sized of houses. The rocks are sharp as knives. The darkness sucks your breath out. No hope for us there. Oh no, no hope, no hope. He went on like this for a few minutes, then crumbled to the ground. The people watching him looked at each other and shook their heads. Gone mad, Lena heard someone say. Yes, completely, said someone else. Suddenly, Sad sprang up again and resumed his terrible shouting. The crowd stepped back. Some of them hurried away. A few of them approached Sad, speaking in calming voices. They took him by the arms and led him, shouting down the steps. Who dat? Who dat? said Poppy in her small, piercing voice. Lena turned away from the miserable sp spectacle. Hush, Poppy, she said. It's a poor, sad man. He doesn't feel good. We mustn't stare. She headed toward Knight Street, which ran along Greengate Square. There, a stringy-haired man sat across, cross-legged on the ground, playing a flute made out of drain pipe, and five or six believers circled him, clapping and singing. Soon, soon, coming soon, they sang. What's coming soon? Lena wondered, but she didn't stop to talk. Two blocks beyond, she came to a store that had no sign in its window. This must be the one, she thought. At first, it looked closely, closed. Its windows was dark, but the door opened when she pushed on it, and a bell attached to its doorknob clinked. From the back room came a black-haired man with big teeth and a long neck. Yes, he said. Lena recognized him. He was the one who had given her the message for the mayor on her very first day of work. His name was Hooper. No, Looper. That was it. Do you have pencils for sale? She asked. It seemed doubtful. The shop's shelves were empty except for a few stacks of used paper. Poppy squirmed on Lena's back and whimpered a little bit. Sometimes, said Looper, Poppy's whimper became a will. All right, you can get down, Lena said to her. She set her on the floor where she tottered about unsteadily. What I'd like, what I'd like to see, said Lena, are your colored pencils? If any, if you have any. We have a few, said Looper. They are somewhat expensive. He smiled, showing his pushy teeth. Could I see them? Said Lena. He went into the back room and returned a moment later, carrying a small box, which he set down on the counter. He took the lid off. Lena bent forward to look. Inside the box were at least a dozen colored pencils. Red, green, blue, yellow, purple, orange. They had never been sharpened. They had never even been sharpened. Their ends were flat. They had erasers. Lena's heart gave a few fast beats. How much are they? She said. Probably too much for you, the man said. Probably not, said the Lena. I have a job. Good, good, the man said, smiling again. No need to take offense. He picked up the yellow pencil and twirled it between his fingers. Each pencil, he said, five dollars. Five dollars? For seven, you could buy a coat. It would be an old patched coat, but still warm. That's too much, Lena said. He shrugged and began to put the lid back on the box. But maybe... Lena's thoughts raced. Let me look at them again. Once more, the man lifted the lid and Lena bent over the pencils. She picked up one. It was painted a deep clear blue 
and on its flat top was the blue dot of the lead. The pink eraser was held on by a shiny metal collar. So beautiful, I could buy just one, Lena thought. Then I could save a little more and buy a coat for Granny next month. Make up your mind, said the man. I have other customers who are interested if you aren't. All right, I'll take one. No, wait. It was like hunger, what she felt. It was the same as when her hand sometimes seemed to reach out by itself to grab a piece of food. It was too strong to resist. I'll take two. She said, and a faint, dazzly feeling came over her at the thought of what she was doing. Which two? The man said. There were more colors in that box of pencils than all of Ember. Ember's colors were all so much the same. Gray buildings, gray streets, black sky, even the colors of people's clothes were faded from long use into mud green and rust red and gray blue. But these colors... They were as bright as the leaves and flowers in the greenhouse. Lena's hand hovered over the pencils. The blue one, she said, and the yellow one. No, the, the, the man made an impatient noise in the back of his throat. The green one, said Lena. I'll take the blue and green. She lifted them out of the box. She took the money from her, the pocket of her coat and handed it to the man, and she put the pencils in her pocket. They were hers now. She felt a fierce, defiant joy. She turned to go, and that was when she saw the baby was no longer in the store. Poppy, she cried. She whirled around. Did you see my little sister go out? She asked the man. Did you see which way she went? He shrugged. Didn't notice, he said. Lena darted into the street and looked in both directions. She saw lots of people, some children, but no Poppy. She stopped an old woman. Have you seen a little girl, a baby, walking by herself in a green jacket with a hood? The old woman just stared at her with dull eyes and shook her head. Poppy, Lena called. Poppy, her voice rose to a shout. Such a little baby couldn't have gone far, she thought. Maybe down towards Green Gate Square where there were more people walking around, she began to run. And then the lights flickered and flickered again and went out. Darkness slammed up in front of her like a wall. She stumbled, caught herself, and stood still. She could see absolutely nothing. Shouts of alarm came from up and down the street and then silence. Lena stretched her arms out. Was she facing the street or a building? Terror swept through her. I must just stand still, she thought. The lights will come back on in a few seconds. They always do. But she thought of Poppy alone in the blackness and her legs went weak. I must find her. She took a step when she didn't bump into anything. She took another step and the fingers in her ring hand crumpled against something hard. The wall of a building, she thought. Keeping her hand against it, she turned left and a little and took another step forward. Then suddenly her hand touched empty hair, air. This would be Deadlock Street, or she had passed Deadlock Street already. She couldn't keep that picture of the streets clear in her mind. The darkness seemed to fill not just the city around her, but the inside of her head as well. Heart pounding, she waited. Come back, lights, she pleaded. Please come back. She wanted to call out to Poppy to tell her to stand still, not to be afraid. She would come for her soon. But the darkness pressed against her and she wouldn't summon her voice. She could hardly breathe. She wanted to claw the darkness away from her eyes as if it were someone's hands. Small sounds came from here and there around her, a whimpering, a shuffling. In the distance, someone called out incoherently. How many minutes had gone by? The longest blackout ever had been 3 minutes and 14 seconds. Surely this was longer. She could have endured it if she had been on her own. It was the thought of Poppy, lost, that she couldn't stand. And lost because she had been paying more attention to a box of pencils. 
Oh, she'd been selfish and greedy and now she was so, so sorry. She made herself take another step forward. But then she thought, what if I'm going away from Poppy? She began to tremble and she felt the sinking and dissolving inside her that meant she was going to cry. Her legs gave away like wet paper and she slid down until she was sitting on the street. With her head in her knees, trembling her mind, a wordless whirl of dread, she waited. An endless time went by. A moan came from somewhere to the left. A door slammed closed. Footsteps started, then stopped. Into Lena's mind floated the beginning of the worst question. What if the lights never... She squeezed her arms around her knees and made the question stop. Lights come back, she said to herself. Lights come back, come back. And suddenly they did. Lena sprang up. There was the street again and people looking upward with their mouths hanging open. All around people started crying or wailing or grinning in relief. Then all at once, everyone started to hurry. Moving fast toward the safety of home in case it should happen again. Lena ran toward Green Gate Square, stopping everyone she passed. Did you see a little girl walking by herself just before the lights went out? She asked. Green jacket with a hood? But no one wanted to listen to her. On the B Street side of the square stood a few people all talking all at once and waving their arms. Lena ran up to them and asked, their, asked her question. They stopped talking and stared at her. How could we have we seen anyone? The lights were out, said Nami's progs. A tiny old woman whose back was so bent that she had to twist her head sideways to look up. Lena said, no, she wandered away before the lights went out. She got away from me. She may have come this direction. You have to keep your eye on a baby, Nami Prog scolded. Babies need watching said one of the women who had been singing with the believers, but someone else said, Oh, a toddler, green jacket? And he walked over to an open door, shop door and called, You have that baby in there. And through the door came someone leading Poppy by the hand. Lena dashed to her and lifted her up. Poppy broke into loud wails. You're all right now, said Lena, holding her tightly. Don't worry, sweetie. You were just lost a moment. Now you're all right. I've got you. Don't worry. When she looked up to thank the person who found her, she saw a face she recognized. It was Dune. He looked the same as when she'd last seen him, except his hair was shaggier. He had the same baggy brown jacket he always wore. She was marching up the street by herself. He said, no one knew who she belonged to, so I took her into my father's shop. She belongs to me, Lena said. She's my sister. I was so afraid when she was lost. I thought she might fall and hurt herself or be knocked over or... Anyway, thank you so much for rescuing her. Anyone would have, said Dune. He frowned and looked down at the pavement. Poppy had calmed down and was curling up against Lena's chest with her thumb in her mouth. And your job? How is it? Lena asked. The pipe works. Dune shrugged his shoulders. All right, he said. Interesting. Anyway, she waited, but it seemed that it was all he was going to say. Well, thank you again, she said. She hoisted Poppy around on her, to her back. Lucky for you, Dune Harrow was around, said Nami Progs, who had been watching them with her sideways glare. He's a good-hearted boy. Anything breaks at my house, he fixes it. She hobbled after Lena, shaking a finger at her. You'd better watch that baby more carefully, she called. You shouldn't leave her alone, the flute player added. I know, said Lena, you're right. When she got home, she put the tired baby to bed in the bedroom they shared. Granny had been taking an afternoon nap in the front room and hadn't noticed the blackout at all. 
Lena told her that the lights had gone out for a few minutes, but she didn't mention anything about Poppy getting lost. Later, in her bedroom, with Poppy asleep, she took the two colored pencils from her pocket. They were not quite as beautiful as they had been. When she held them, she remembered the powerful wanting she had felt in that dusty store, and the feeling of it was mixed up with fear and shame and darkness.